Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gabreski, and I'll be your host for today. October is upon us, and we are celebrating space exploration. So all month long, we'll be connecting with uh, astronauts, we'll be connecting with scientists and engineers and researchers who are pushing the limits of our exploration, exploring our solar system and beyond, but also turning an eye back on our planet and looking how it's changing and what we can do to help protect our one home. Today, we have an amazing event. I always love when we have a chance to connect with Nicole Stott. Nicole was a NASA astronaut. She spent time on the space shuttle as well as the International Space Station. She's also a NASA aquanaut, which means she was diving down in the Aquarius Reef Base uh, for saturation dives and missions, spending 18 days on one of the longest missions to that undersea habitat. She's also an artist, so she really likes to combine her artwork and spaceflight experience to inspire creative thinking about solutions to our planetary challenges, to raise awareness of the interplay between science and art. And she is the founder of the Space for Art Foundation. So let's get Nicole in live with us right now. Here we go. Hey, Nicole, how are you doing today? Hey, Joe, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It is always great to see you, Nicole. We have a huge group of classrooms today, some on camera, some tuning in live on YouTube. Uh, we're really excited to spend a little time with you. Nice. Love it. And as I always say, you know, the, the name of this, of your whole thing, this exploring by the seat of your pants, uh, I think it's just perfect. I think it's what we all do, even when we plan it. <laughs> Absolutely. No question. <laughs> I do want to do a quick shout out here. I can see we've got grade fours in Oregon saying hi. We've got students in Kansas City, students in Guelph, Ontario. So hey to those students. Keep saying hi in the chat. Uh, and I'm going to let you take over for a little bit, Nicole. Okay. And so, Joe, just to let you know, all I've been seeing the whole time has been my PowerPoint that's up. I don't know if you've got that up now. Um, I've got the PowerPoint up now. And don't worry, we had you nice and front and center. So we got it. Ah, okay. Good all right. Good. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, as uh, as Joe mentioned, I've I've been really blessed with the opportunity to uh, explore our planet from from above as well as beneath the surface of it. And I'll tell you, it has a real a real impact on you. And so, as we talk today, and hopefully through the questions, I I want you guys um, to think about the simple things that we learn when we do really complex things like go to space or live under the ocean for an extended period of time. It really brings you back to the very basic nature of, of who we are. And I can tell you after living in space uh, for a little over three months, I came back to earth with really simple lessons from it that I think apply to everything I do in my life and the decisions I make and and I hope you'll consider them as well. I mean, there are things like we live on a planet and you guys all know that already, right? We live on a planet. We're all earthlings. Only border that matters, that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. And you can see that really beautifully on this screen, uh, this picture that I took of earth from space, that thin veil, thin blue line. And uh, the overarching message, the big message, that I want all of you to take away today, and I will end with it today as well, is that we absolutely have the power. If we behave like crewmates and not passengers, we have the power to create a future for all life on earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. So let's start with uh, inspiration. I mean, I hope that through all of what you're gonna hear today, of what you're gonna hear through the other speakers, explorers that come, uh, to Joe's sessions with you that you'll you'll realize that that inspiration is a huge deal in helping us form what we want to do in our lives, how we want to be a part of the solutions around us. And um, from what I've seen and experienced, inspiration really comes through the awe and wonder that surrounds us every day. And also by appreciating that in a way that we understand the things we're most curious about that we want to learn more about, that we want to figure out how we can take those things we love and apply them to what we do in our lives. And for me, that started out with flying. Uh, I am actually in the front seat of this airplane with my dad, uh, too small at that point for my head to pop over uh, that front cockpit. 
But just lifting off the planet that way, being around people that loved flying really inspired me to not just want to know how I could fly, want to know how things fly. And that led me, long story short, through going to school to study aeronautical engineering while I was there, uh, thinking about, man, if I want to know how airplanes fly, why would I not want to know how rocket ships fly? And that got me thinking about you know, NASA and everything that was going on in space that uh, I honestly believe everything that's going on in space is ultimately about improving life on Earth. And why would you not want to be a part of that? And so I was really fortunate out of college to get a job with NASA as an engineer. I worked hands-on with the people that were doing all of the work to get the space shuttle and the space station ready to fly in space. And then uh, a few years later, applied to be an astronaut. And I can tell you that was a really difficult decision for me to apply to be an astronaut. This job that my whole life seemed like it was something that only other special people get to do. Why would they pick me? And I was very thankful to people that I considered to be mentors, uh, some of which were teachers, some were people I worked with who really did nothing more than encourage me to pick up the pen and fill out the application. That one thing I had total control of in the whole process was to fill out that application. And believe me, I thank them every time I see them. It gave me the opportunity to be part of this picture, which is uh, the 18th group of astronauts. We got selected way long ago. Gosh, I can't believe that was 23 years ago. Uh, into the 18th group of NASA astronauts. And I think it's fun to look at this picture. We're being kind of goofy. You know, we're being people kind of joking around. We didn't really know each other all that well when we took this picture, uh, probably about two weeks after we'd been selected. But I look at it now and I see the personality of all of these people that I consider to be part of my family in this picture. Everyone has flown in space. A couple of them you might have heard of, like Bob and Doug, who did the first SpaceX crewed mission. Uh, Steve Bowen just got back from space again. My friend Mike is getting ready to go again. I mean, a group of people who have explored on and off the planet as well. And I love that um, not one of them got to this place the same way. They all had different backgrounds in school and jobs that they had and things they love, like water skiing and cooking and art and house building and, I don't know, uh, race car driving and all, all of these kinds of things that make them the people they are and that you'd want to spend time with in space. And after getting selected to be an astronaut, it's kind of fun. You know, um, one of the big things is that we do a lot that's a lot like going back to school. We are learning all about the spaceships we're going to fly on, about the science we're going to do. We're doing things to keep our bodies healthy. Uh, we're learning how to do spacewalks and fly that big robotic arm, all of those things that we're going to do in space. But underlying all of it is how we work as a good crew how we work as really good teammates, how we discover you know, our own strengths and weaknesses and how we can put those together with our crewmates' strengths and weaknesses to have a successful mission. And we do that training in a lot of different ways. And one of my very favorite, and, and Joe mentioned it, <clears throat> was to go live underwater. Uh, we lived underwater as a crew for 18 days on the Aquarius Reef Base, this undersea habitat. And it is absolutely the closest thing you can get to what it's like to live in space. Uh, you're, you're living in this extreme environment where, as you can see, to go outside, you have to put on special equipment. Uh, if something goes wrong at 60 feet under the ocean where you are there, you can't just swim to the surface to, uh, to escape it. You have to work with your crew to figure out how to manage it at 60 feet underwater until you're in a safe configuration come to the surface. And the same thing is true when we live in space. You can't just hop in your spaceship anytime you want to come home. You have to work with your crew to take care of the problems that are happening in there in space before you're in a good configuration to maybe come back to Earth. Uh, really, really wonderful experience to, as astronauts, we say, we get to go live and work in inner space to learn how to live and work in outer space. And it works really beautifully. And I want to show you um, 
just this is a quick hopefully it'll play okay joe it's just like a two and a half minute video of uh some of the stuff i got to do in space and uh it's a little bit more fun than just me just talking about pictures so if i can push the button here and get that little thing down there again and hopefully you guys can see um can you hear it uh we see it there's a little bit of volume. Can you try and turn the volume off a bit on your side? Yeah. Ah, that's better. How's that? Yeah, good. Okay. That was fun for me. <laughs> so as you can see in that in that little video, hopefully, Joe, did that work all right? Yeah, it played great, Nicole. Did that the video work okay? Yep. Okay, good. I never know when you know you're playing it through um, you know, through the interweb whether it's gonna play all right or not. Okay, so both times I went to space, I went to the International Space Station. Um, this is a picture of it. You saw us docking to it with the space shuttle, it's ginormous. Size of, size of a football field if you laid it on the ground. Interior volume, like a big six bedroom house. I mean, you can float your separate ways uh, with your crew of six or seven and never see each other all day if you didn't want to. But um, we come together a lot for meals and all kinds of things to work together. And um, I could talk all day about this image of this masterpiece in space best example of living off the grid that you can find with those ginormous solar arrays, the way we generate our clean drinking water, clean our air, um, absolutely maintain this life support system uh, so that we can live as a crew and do the science and all the work we want to do on the space station. And the space station's motto is off the earth for the earth. Again, that speaks to the fact that these 15 and more countries that have come together over the past 25 years in space are everything that we're doing there is ultimately about improving life on Earth. And yes, helping us explore further off our planet, but all of that is brought back to Earth in one way or another in a very positive way to improve life on Earth. And, you know, I talked earlier about us being crewmates and not passengers. And it's really, really important when you live on a mechanical spaceship orbiting our planet 16 times a day that you behave like a crew. 
So every morning we get up and we pay attention to how much, um, you know, how clean our air is, is how much CO2 is in our atmosphere, how much clean drinking water we have, the integrity of our thin metal hull that's protecting us from the, you know, the vacuum of space. And we pay attention to the health and well-being of all of our crewmates. And that's absolutely the same kind of thing we need to be doing on our planetary spaceship. And so we need to be living like crewmates and not passengers. Now, this is the crew that I spent my first flight with uh, on the space station. You can see there's nine of us in this picture. Normally there would be six on the station, but three had come up before three went home. And I love this picture because it just, really just in a fun way shows me what the best kind of people to work with are. You want to have fun no matter where you are. You want to be enjoying yourself, whether you're in space or down here on earth or living under the ocean or, you know, orbiting the planet. And you should, you should enjoy yourself as a group of humans in, in whatever place it is. But at the same time, I look at this picture and I look into the eyes of every one of these people and I know that when things weren't going to go or didn't go as planned on the space station, that every single one of these people would have my back and would be taking care of me. And I know that they trusted that I would have theirs. And that's the best kind of people to work with, no matter where you are. They've got personality and they're professionals and they're going to bring it so that the mission is successful. And yes, we have goofy clown noses on in that picture. Uh, now we go to this place. Why do we even go to space? Um, why do we go undersea to, to explore and discover new things? Well, because we want to explore and discover new things. And by going to space, one of the things that we can do that is really, really valuable, turns out to be really valuable, is we can take gravity out of the equation. So we float, everything floats. And what that allows us to do is to observe to explore, to look at things in a whole new way than we can when we're down here in Earth's gravity. And the scientists love it. And we can learn things about pretty much every area of science that you can imagine. And we are doing that on board the space station. So we, as the crew, are observers in all of this science. And not only are we the ones doing observations from these spacey platforms like the space station, but our scientists are putting instruments in those places, satellites orbiting our earth to do what I like to think of as measuring the vital signs of our planet, observing earth in a way that allows us to understand, have the data that we need to understand and develop solutions to our greatest planetary challenges. And, um, this the picture or the little video in the top right i mean that's this like bringing it to life measure of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and by looking at this and over time and understanding it we can figure out ways to help minimize the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere what we can do to solve that problem and it, i'll just say if you ever have the chance to get to uh, washington dc and go to the NASA headquarters building, there's a really beautiful installation now called the Earth Information Center, where they are doing all of these kinds of things to bring to life the data that's coming to us from space and how we understand what's going on Earth and sharing that with everyone. Not just the scientists who are off um, figuring out the solutions to the problems, but for all of us to be able to go in and see and experience it and understand how we can be part of the crew that helps um, solve those problems too. And um, we observe from these places, wherever we explore, I think we are always observing because we're human beings too. We want to immerse ourselves in these new places that we're surrounded by. And I can tell you as astronauts, when we have free time, we are spending it in front of a window in front of a windows like this, like the cupola module, these big bay windows that face towards Earth to just really experience our planetary home from that vantage point. And we do it um, for, I think, not just to see it, but to feel it, to like bring it into ourselves. So those lessons like, oh my gosh, we live on a planet, they come to life through that view, that experience we have of Earth from that very special vantage point. 
But I think we can have those same kind of experiences down here with our feet on the planet too. Just looking up towards the sky and recognizing, acknowledging that it's just this thin blue line. It's not blue that goes on forever and um, that we're all earthlings and that that thin blue line is the only border that matters and how we can behave like better crewmates. And one of the things that astronauts will do, I've, um, I've gotten this from all of my astronaut friends and colleagues, is that when you come back to Earth, you want to share that experience in as many ways as you possibly can. And all of us find our own way to do that. As Joe mentioned, art is the way that that's come to life for me. Uh, I had the chance to paint while I was on the space station with watercolors, which was really super fun. And after doing that, I just kept thinking, man, maybe art could be a way to share the spaceflight experience that um, would be would be really meaningful to me and hopefully to the others that I'm sharing it with. And so we do art with kids all over the world. Um, we create art spacesuits and other um, planetary community projects as we like to think about it. Uh, our motto is that we are uniting uh, a planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art. And uh, I wanted to show you a little bit of um, how we do that. Um, those are a couple of the art suits. We go and we spend time with kids all over the world, mostly in like pediatric cancer centers and refugee centers and orphanages around the world. And kids create individual pieces of art. And then we're very fortunate to work with the team of people at ILC Dover. They are the spacesuit company. They made the spacesuit I did, my spacewalk in, the suits that walked on the moon during Apollo, and they're making the suits that are gonna go back to the moon. And um, we've had the chance to create these suits and get a couple of them up to space and for the kids that worked on them to see them there. And I just love how they come to life this way, where these kids can see their art come together uh, in, a very, in a very meaningful way um, on the space station. Or um, we do a lot of virtual things where we can send stuff to space too as videos. And this next thing I'll show you um, some of the ways that we've been able to do that. Um, kids creating er artwork, the art comes together into these beautiful um, like visual mosaics. And we're able to share that with uh, the crews on board the space station too. And I will put a big shout out to Mr. Joe for supporting the collection of artwork for the last suit that we did and um, for the next one that's under construction. And I can't wait to share that one with you guys as well. And now bringing it back to Earth in preparation for our next adventures in space. This is a picture of the four people that at the end of next year will be traveling back to the moon. After over 50 years, we will have human beings traveling back to the moon. They're gonna orbit the moon and test out all the equipment so that a crew you know, a year or so after that will be able to put boots on the moon again. And I just love the way we're doing this. These four human beings here, these four earthlings are awesome, all in their own way. Uh, we've got an international crew here with Jeremy, who is representing Canada. I'll just throw out the Canada um, mention there, Jeremy Hansen. We've got Victor Glover, first person of color to travel off our planet this way to deep space, to the moon. Uh, uh, Christina Cook, the first woman who will do that kind of space travel, and my buddy Reed Wiseman, who uh, will be the commander of that mission and uh, take those folks to the moon and bring them safely back to the Earth so that we can uh, continue that journey off the planet, off the Earth, for the Earth. Cannot wait to see that happen. Uh, and all four of these people have been part, Joe, have been part of our um, Space for Art Foundation work too, which I am very thankful for. Uh, I would love to see their spacesuits be a little more colorful than just that orange uh, as they travel around the moon, but um, can't count on that. Uh, but maybe a little dabble of something on them. And when they come back to Earth or while they're out there sharing that experience uh, of our planetary home from space again, I hope it will remind us all again how we live on a planet. We are all Earthlings only border that matters, that thin blue line of atmosphere, and how important it is for us to accept our role as crewmates and not passengers here on Spaceship Earth.
All right, I'll, I'll be quiet and hopefully that we have some questions. All right, Nicole, thank All you right. for another great presentation. Thank uh, you. And absolutely, there are gonna be questions. We have a ton of classrooms, so we need to get <laughs> right into it. How do uh, I get my PowerPoint off the screen, Joe? Tell me what to do, is it the command tab thing? Yeah, just you can either just uh, close your PowerPoint or if you go down to the bottom, find your Google icon for Chrome and you should be able to click on it and it'll bring you back to the front with us. Okay, so do I need to stop sharing or do you do that? Uh, I can take it away so it's just you and me now. Okay, all right, cool. <laughs> cool, all right. Well, as I mentioned, we've got lots of classrooms tuning in online. Uh, so send in your questions via the chat and we'll work some of those in. But let's start visiting some of our camera classrooms and let's start taking some of those questions. So. Okay. Let's see, we have in Maine, grade four is hanging out with Miss McGinnis. Let me bring them in front and center. There they are, Miss McGinnis. Yay. All right, Boy, class. How are we doing everyone? Ooh, the helmet, love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Get it right in front of the There you are. Go ahead and ask your question, honey. Hi, my name is Emma. Um, what's your favorite job out of all your jobs? Oh, wow. Okay, Emma, that's a great question. And I have to answer mom. <laughs> it's my very favorite job out of all my jobs. Okay. And I, my son is 21 now, which is really, really difficult for me to believe. Um, and he's off studying things about how to fly and um, maintain airplanes, which is really exciting to me. I'd like to think I had maybe some influence over that. But I just love that job. And I think that it plays into every other job I've ever had as an engineer, as an astronaut, as an aquanaut, now as an artist and working with this foundation. I think mom is one of those things that just plays really nicely into all of those jobs. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great Welcome. question. Do you have another one on deck? Do you guys want to pop up with another one? Yeah. Hi, my name is Wes, and I was wondering, were you nervous when you first went up there? Uh, Wes, that's a great question. Was I nervous when I first went up there? You know, I was nervous, but not about the spaceship, you know, not about launch and what we were about to do. Um, I think everybody's really, um, I don't know, really respectful of the fact that, you know, you're about to launch on this rocket, but we've done all this training I think to prepare us in the best possible way for whatever we could do if something was to go wrong, right? Which is what you would be nervous about if, um, you know, when you're launching on a rocket. The thing that I was most nervous about though, was um, my family watching me do this. And maybe that goes to the mom thing again too, is that I think as human beings, we're wanting to involve all of our family and friends in these kind of really cool experiences that we have. But to do that, they have to watch you launch into space. They have to watch you get into that rocket and do that. And my son, who's now 21, was seven when I flew to space the first time. So all I could think about was him and my husband and my mom and my sisters watching me launch to space, which is a lot more difficult to do than being the person sitting in the rocket. All right. Thanks, Thanks buddy. Great question. Okay, let's go to Alabama this time. Mrs. Foster's class is hanging out with us today. How are we doing, everyone? Alabama. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, when did you know you wanted to be an astronaut? When did I know I wanted to be an astronaut? Well, it was a little bit later in life. I mean, I'm I'm old enough that I watched that first moon landing, which it's hard for me to believe I'm old enough to have watched that first moon landing. But I did, and I was really excited about flying. Even as I think even when you're six or seven, you realize that seeing on even on TV or going out and looking in the moon and thinking about people being there, that that's a really extraordinary thing. So I think that was with me for a long time. I wanted to know how things fly. I wanted to fly myself. Space became the place that was really interesting to me that way. But it was a while um, after working already for NASA that I started thinking about astronaut as something that might be possible for me. So um, those mentors that I talked to you about, reaching out to them was huge. As I realized that um, as a NASA engineer, watching what astronauts do, which 
almost 99.9% .9 of it, I would say, is not flying in space. And seeing that a lot of that was like what I was already doing as an engineer, that gave me some encouragement to think about it. But it was those people like reaching out to them and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And having them lift me up in that decision just to pick up the pen and fill out the application, that was huge. And, and realizing that um, it's not just about the adventure to be an astronaut, right? It's, it's about the work that we're going to do there. That was the big thing to me. Okay. All right, let's snag another question. Go ahead. Um, what is your favorite moment in space? Oh, <laughs> what's my favorite? All of them all wrapped up together is my favorite moment. It's really, really difficult to choose a favorite moment in space. I mean, there was the first time I actually got to float and fly to look out the window and see Earth, like to see Earth as a planet out the window, just glowing there to work on the science with my crewmates, to be floating around the dinner table talking about how we would solve all of Earth's problems, to talk on a phone from space to my family on Earth. All of those moments um, really, really kind of wrap up together into this one big moment about the experience. Um, very difficult question to answer. So all of it, I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> all right, thanks to our crew in Alabama. Those are some great questions. Bye. 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 <laughs> All right, we're going to jump to another class this time. We've got uh, the Phoenix School. Where's Phoenix School joining us from today? Salem, Massachusetts. Let me bring them in front and center. Wow. Here they come. Hey, Phoenix School. Hi. 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 I was going to say Arizona, but you're not. <laughs> we would. Aw. Hey, you want to come up? Okay. Um, when, when you were in space, did you find anything like odd? Did I find anything odd? Well, it all feels a little odd when you first get there. Like to be, imagine you're moving in three dimensions, like floating in your classroom now and how, you know, your body would feel when you're doing that. That's a little odd at first, but what's I think maybe even odder is that it becomes natural and normal really quickly to move that way. And everything about the way you live in space is a little odd at first. Um, one of the things that really surprised me, which I guess you would call that odd too, was looking out the window and seeing a shooting star below me from space. That was really super weird at first. Like to think about how what seems normal is to be standing on Earth and looking up at the night sky to see a shooting star and then to have one go between my spaceship and the earth was, that was a little weird. And I wish I would have thought about making a wish when I saw it, because you know how you never see another one again when you're trying to after you see that first one, but um, that was that was cool. But everything's a little bit odd at first. All right, you got another one on deck for us, Massachusetts. Yeah, hey, Leon, you wanna go up? How did you manage to have internet in the International Space Station to call your family? Because ah, not even airplanes. Say that again, because because not even in airplanes you have it. How ah. do you have it? In <laughs> yeah, well, thankfully they have it on some airplanes now, which is nice. Although I find myself never wanting to really pay for it, but. Um... <laughs> Uh, on the International Space Station, the way we do all of our communication is via satellites. So satellites that are way above us orbiting the planet, we can use them to, um, with like we have antenna on our spaceship and just like you would down on Earth, have antenna to receive the communication links from satellites down here on Earth. We do that same thing on the space station. So all of our communication, whether it's the internet or just talking on the radio or using that, what I called, I would call it a satellite phone from the space station is all based on, um, you know, signals going way up like 23,000 miles into space and then coming back down to earth and then back up to us. And so it works really, really well. Um, and we do some of that down here on earth too. And it's really nice that they've, 
that they've set that up for us because you want to be able to talk to your family and friends, not just to talk to the people, you know, in mission control that you're working with, but to be able to communicate with your family and friends when you're on a space station or, you know, anywhere else on earth for that matter. All right. Thank you, Phoenix School. Great yeah, question. Good question. So you were saying magic of technology, some satellite. Yeah. Let's jump to the other side of the Atlantic. We've got a class All of right. people hanging out with us today. Mr. Mark Screw is hanging out with us. How are we doing today? All right. So let's get that microphone unmuted and let's grab a question or two. Oh, it's still on mute. There we there go. There it is. Hi. Hi, my name is Afonso, uh, and I really like to know how does a boy or a girl uh, outside of the United States can do to become an astronaut? A great question, Alfonso, and I love that uh, that now um, there are a number a of different ways to um, to do that to be able to. Uh, for, for you guys, I think the European Space Agency is probably the way to go if you wanted to be a professional astronaut. So just like for me with NASA, I had to apply and interview and go through that whole process. There are space agencies around the world that have that same kind of thing available for the citizens of their countries. And there are ways now that are opening up more with the commercial space um, businesses that are out there. Uh, right now, that's a little expensive, but there are ways through your countries to get onto those uh, those spaceships too. And just lots going on. But the only way I really know about is to work through your country and your country's space agency to apply to be an astronaut. All right, let's see if we have another question uh, from our class in Portugal. Uh, how do you take a shower in space? <laughs> well, uh, on the space station, we don't have running water, uh, but and and it's very different, you know, because things float, and um, so we don't take showers like you would think of, you know, here on Earth. But it's so much fun to take advantage of the environment that is there and uh, kind of play with the water to take a shower, to take a bath. So. Imagine you saw that picture. I had a ball of water kind of squirted out at the end of a straw. Imagine I could squirt out kind of a bigger ball of hot water and then I could stick my arm through it and it would make a glove of water on my arm because there's no gravity to pull that water down. So unless I shook it off, it was going to stay on my arm. So then I could mush soap around on that water on my arm and then put my arm through another ball of water to rinse off and use a towel or I could just squirt water right onto my body and make a big glove of water on me and get clean um, that way. And it was really interesting to me because it was very different to what I do down on earth to stay clean, but I could stay clean in space by using the kind of uniqueness of that environment to, to do so. And so it was different. It just wasn't more difficult. And it, then you just have to get used to it, but it worked really well. All right. And it was uh, fun. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> so many, so many classes today. So let's go to, let's go to Canada. We've got some grade five, sixes hanging out with us. So I'm going to bring them in. Looks like they've got their microphone turned on for us. All right, five, sixes. We're ready for you. Nice and loud. Hi, I'm Isa. Um, are you retired? Hi, Isa. Well, you know, I am retired from NASA, so I'm not working for NASA anymore, but I would never, like right now, I'm probably busier than I ever have been in my entire life. So I don't, I, uh, retirement is not that retiring. <laughs> so I'm doing a lot of work with the Space for Art Foundation, you know, with the kids around the world for those projects. I do a lot of speaking events. I get out to a lot of schools. I love doing this with Joe. Um, just I do consulting like as an engineer still, especially with that company ILC Dover that's doing all the spacesuit work. Really cool to be able to work on those kinds of things for astronauts like you guys when you guys go to space and are wearing all kinds of cool new spacesuits. So um, I would say I retired from NASA, but I am not retired. <laughs> all right. Milton, do you have another question for us? 
Yeah. Mm. Hi, I'm Malcolm. When you first called your family in space, what did you say? Uh, when I first called my family from space, I was like, I was kind of probably giggling or, you know, I, I was excited because it was so cool to be in that place and be able to call them. I mean, the our space agencies on the station have set it up so nicely for us to be able to communicate with our families. And I was probably, I, I mean, I don't re vividly remember, I guess I was, it was just a little bit overwhelming with the excitement of it, but just to know I was there, that they were happy about that. I was telling them about how beautiful earth is, what it was like to float, how I wish they were there, you know, all the kinds of things I think I would tell them if I was, you know, traveling to the other side of the planet somewhere too. Very fun. All right. Thanks for those questions from Milton, Ontario. Uh, we're going to go to North Bay this time. I think we've got some third and fourth graders hanging out with us. How are we doing, North Bay? Hey, North Bay. Hey. Hi. <laughs> you love it. <laughs> What was your scariest, scariest moment in space? My scariest moment in space um, probably was the couple seconds in the middle of the night when the alarm was going off. That, so we had alarms go off, you know, telling us if things were wrong on the space station or warning us just in case something might be wrong. And I think about a week after being in space, um, it was probably like three o'clock in the morning and I was sleeping. It was the best sleep I've ever had in my life was inside um, the space station. And so soundly sleeping and this big alarm starts going off at like three o'clock in the morning. So I think that was a couple seconds of like, oh my gosh, what's going on? A little bit of fear there. And then it was kind of cool to see how our crew came together and just took care of everything. And that kind of took the fear away, which was nice. Yeah, when there's alarm going off telling you that all the air might be going out of your space station, that's a little scary. <laughs> How did, hi, my name's Mia. How does the spacesuit protect you? Uh, great question, Mia. The, so the spacesuit actually is like your own little personal spaceship. So everything that the space station has to do for us, you know, provide clean air for us to breathe, um, take the CO2 out of the air, keep us comfortable temperature wise and also protect us you know in a way because there's no air out in space um the space suit does that and so it has all of these layers of material that protect us that way it's got a little thermostat on it that allows either cold or hot water to circulate in the suit to keep us warm or cool us off it's got air flowing it's got a radio for us to communicate and um, and it's got this rubber bladder, like this bladder inside of it, this big rubber suit inside of the suit. That's what you know keeps the pressure on our body uh, to be able to be out there in the vacuum of space. So it's like your own little personal spaceship. All right, great questions from our group in North Bay. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Yeah. Um, we have two more classrooms to visit on camera but before we do that nicole i want to do a lightning round with a couple questions from youtube okay. here. all right i'll be fast <laughs> so let's see who we've got here let's work our way down do a couple of them um how long were you officially an astronaut this is from a classroom in new jersey uh 15 years all right um did you have any trouble this is our classroom in kansas city is wondering uh learning to walk again when you came back to earth was that a little bit tricky when you you know, I actually felt better than I thought I would. Um, what you feel is really, really super heavy. And there's a little bit of, you know, disorientation at first, at least for me, if I moved my head like this, it was like the whole world was spinning. And I wish that was like for a day where I'm like, oh man, if I could just get sick, I would feel better, but I couldn't. And then my body readapted. But I think the thing for walking is you just feel really, really heavy to like the point of having to stand up straight, hold your head up. and. You don't have to think about that while you're in space. All right. Uh, Miss Valadrian's class would like to know what, or was it hard? Did you find the training for space difficult? Uh, there was a, a lot of difficult things. I mean, things that were different for me that I had not done before. Like a lot of that, like that undersea training. Um, I was a diver. I enjoyed recreational diving, but that was really intense, advanced kinds of diving stuff that we had to do. So kind of psychologically, 
you know, more than physically, that was really, really challenging for me to overcome this fear of having my mask off or the regulator out of my mouth or doing things underwater where I knew I had to stay underwater. Um, learning to speak Russian was really, really difficult. I had never learned another language and you had to learn to speak Russian to fly on the space station. Um, the, the spacewalk training in that big 300 pound suit, you know, even though they were lifting you and putting you in a pool, probably the most physically challenging thing I've ever done. So it really motivated you to get to the gym and stay in shape. So for all of these things that were challenging and difficult, what was great was there were people there to help you figure out how to overcome that. And um, I think that's another part of working as a really good crew. It's not just the people that you're on your mission with. It's all these support people around you that are there to really lift you up and get you into the best shape and figuring out how to overcome all of those things. All right. Very cool. Let's see some faces again. We've got Miss. Bullock's crew hanging out in, looks like, Georgia. Let's get them in front and center. Here they come. Right. Hey, Georgia. Georgia. <laughs> Ashton, I'll ask you real quick. My name's Ashton, and I was wondering, how is it leaving the atmosphere and coming back into the atmosphere? Ah, is you know, it's the, both of those things are um, some of the funnest parts of flying in space, you know, when you leave the atmosphere to launch into space, a lot of energy, right? You know, really shaking on the launch pad, the vehicle's moving, you're, you know, I mean, it's a lot of energy to get, Earth really wants to hold us here. Gravity is a big deal. So it's a lot of energy to get you off the Earth. Um, and then coming back to Earth, I don't know, on the, and I flew on the space shuttle. So we landed on a runway, that little chirp on the runway. And I'll tell you, that felt just like this graceful, like movement back into the atmosphere, a little bit of a rumble, but just really, really graceful. And it was really impressive to me that all that energy that it took to get us into space, we had to get rid of it coming back into Earth's atmosphere and how graceful that could be to go from 17,500 miles an hour orbiting the planet to slowing down to like 150 miles an hour to land on that runway. Um, we are pretty awesome as human beings, the things that we can figure out, the problems that we can solve when we decide we want to do it. And so getting into the atmosphere, coming home, yeah, highly recommend it. <laughs> All right, Ms. Bullis Class, do you have another one there for us? Um, my name is Blake Hood, and I'm wondering, is there a way that students could do the training? Uh, yeah, well, you know, there are ways for you to do the training. There's a lot of stuff online that you can look at to help prepare you. There's um, space camps all over the place that, um, you know, offer up stuff like that. I think even as a school, you could go online or talk to the people at space camp and figure out, you know, the different kinds of things that astronauts do to train to go to space. And you could do a lot of that already on your own, staying in shape. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but like getting to the gym and really understanding how your body works and how you can be the strongest and, um, you know, the healthiest that you can be. That's part of being an astronaut. Learning how to speak another language, big deal. I mean, when we go to space now, it's not just as one country. It's as an international community. And we have to be able to communicate with each other. Um, science. You know, learning about not having to know the details of every kind of science, but understanding all of the different kind of science that's out there and how it applies to solving the problems that we have. And, you know, doing things that help you work as a good team. Um, that could be stuff, you know, like scouts or camping or, you know, doing things out together that are kind of adventure-y. Um, uh, that and even in your classroom on projects, it might seem silly, but being able to work with each other and solve big problems together, that's probably one of the most important things that we do as astronauts. Gets to that whole crewmate thing. Absolutely. Thank you. And go outside, Hi. nature, appreciate the nature around you, figure out how to get involved with uh, things right here on Earth um, that. Uh, this whole exploration thing, you know, by the seat of your pants or out walking around or hiking, it is a big deal. And, and that's what we look for in astronauts too. Absolutely. And then when you turn 10, 
go yeah. out and try scuba diving. That yes. My advice. That's yeah, we got our son in the water at 10 and he was the most naturally talented scuba diver and still is that I've ever met. And I think by getting out there young, it's yep. it just is in you. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Mr. V's crew. Mr. V's crew is joining us from Penetanguishene in Ontario. Let's get them in. Where are they? There they are. Woo! Hi there. Thanks so much for having us on. We really appreciate it. Uh, what kind of experience did you perform in space? What was your role? What kind of experiment? Yeah. So, um, so really as astronauts now in space, we do everything. And it's one of the most fun things about being an astronaut. You're doing all the maintenance on the space station, right? So if the toilet breaks, you're fixing the toilet. If something happens with your electricity, you're fixing that or your radios everything we we work on the space station like the technicians the maintenance people we do all of the science too and the science is so cool because there's science up there that represents pretty much every area of science you can imagine and we get to get involved with that uh as the kind of the eyes ears hands implementers for the scientists down on earth um one of my favorite things was the plant experiments it sounds kind of simple, but as a human being, I think we enjoy having nature around us inside of a space station. There's not a lot of nature. So the plant experiments were really, really interesting to me because of being able to open them up and smell them and touch them and know that what I was doing with them was helping us figure out how to do farming better on Earth, but also for us to explore off the planet. Um, how, how fuels burn. We have a big combustion chamber on the space station. And, you know, fuels burn kind of in the shape of a sphere in space. And you can look at all of the mixture of the fuel in a totally different way than you can down here on Earth. And that helps you figure out how to pollute less and be more efficient. And then all of the experiments that we're part of with our cells and our body um, that help us understand humans and our physiology through the environment of space that helps us improve um, for life on Earth. Um, but pretty much any area of science you can imagine, there's something going on on the space station. All right, Mr. V, you have one more question there for us. Hey, backwards. Backward, moonwalk. Um, <laughs> moonwalk. Hi, my name is Evelyn. And um, what, did, what did it feel like doing your spacewalk? As in wow. what was going through your head? Yeah. yeah, Evelyn, all kinds of things were going through my mind, like um, being very deliberate and diligent about making sure my tether was on and that I was going to do things safely out there. Um, the, the world just opens up to you. Um, you're out there by yourself in your own little personal spaceship looking through this, you know, this clear visor back at Earth floating above the planet that way, you know, outside of the confines of your bigger spaceship. Um, and I think a lot of what was going through my mind was just being able to do the work that I'd trained to do. You know, you don't know. All of what you've done before you go out the first time to do a spacewalk has been done in a pool or done in a virtual reality lab. So to be in that big suit where it doesn't weigh anything, where you can just effortlessly move, where I could be on the end of the arm of that big robotic arm, holding onto a box that weighed 900 pounds, and it felt like it weighed nothing to me up there. And just the peacefulness of it, all of it was a little bit like of a, you know, like overwhelming sensory wise. But the big thing for me was, okay, let me get my job done, which... <laughs> You know, you want to make sure you, you do while you're out there. All right. Thanks, Mr. V's crew. Great questions. Our final class. Thank you for being so patient, Miss Peterson. Oh, crew. Yes, yes. All right. How's everyone doing? Oh, hey, guys. Hi. All right, Sophia, go ask a question. Oh, Aloha. Hi. Hi. A boa. No, I thought it was a, I thought it was a lay at first, but it's a boa. Okay, nice. So my question is, when you're in the underwater habitat, was there any leaks or any problems when you were down there? No, we were, I mean, we trained for how we would deal with that if there was. And we, on our crew, we have two people that are dedicated to taking care of the habitat for us because 
you know, we're only there for that three weeks. So we don't know it as well as the people who are there all the time and maintain it and really take care of it. So we had two people like that, but we didn't have anything like that. What we ended up having, I don't know if you remember, I showed you a picture um, with this big yellow helmet on. So we, we did, we did went outside and did diving every day. We were either in big scuba gear or we went outside and kind of walked around on the bottom of the ocean. And we had this big helmet on, a lot like a spacesuit helmet. And it had a big hose that went back to the habitat that allowed us to get air and move around. And we were having some, not leaks, but we were having some little electrical issues with that helmet. Like in the, we think it was in the comm cap, the communications thing that's built into the helmet itself. So every now and then we'd be out there and you'd, I don't know if you guys have any of the, the metal fillings in your teeth, but every now and then you'd get this like sensation in your mouth. Like, I think there's something electrical going on. And then we'd have to come in and take care of that. So weird, weird kinds of stuff that can happen. It wasn't expected. And I think that's what's so neat about working as a team, working with the experts in a place that you can solve problems that are really things you didn't even expect to have happen. And it was kind of cool to be able to fix that and then be able to go out and do the rest of our mission. Thank yeah, you. But very happy there wasn't any leaks. <laughs> All right, Ms. Pearson, screw you got one more for us. Yeah, we do. Awesome. What was it like eating in space? Uh, well, I love eating anywhere. So it was really great to be able to eat in space too. And of course, everything floats. Um, so you're not eating your food on a plate or anything. The food is very different to what we tend to eat every day, day down here, you know, packaged, add water to it. Um, not a lot of mix of textures because you don't want little crumbs floating around that can get in your eyes or that you can breathe in and stuff, but really loved the food. Um, a great mix of food from all of the countries. So we had a really nice variety of things and you could find stuff that tasted great as well. But I would put a challenge to you guys. I think one of the things we really have to work on for the future especially as we go further off our planet, where like, say when you guys are going to Mars and it's like this six to nine month journey to Mars and you're on a tiny little spaceship, we're not gonna be able to use the food that we're familiar with down here on earth or that's similar to what we have on the space station right now, because there's no way to resupply it or store it or, you know, or even prepare it like we do in space right now. So we're gonna have to revolutionize what food is. Is it that little sponge you add water to and it? you know, miraculously tastes and smells like what we normally eat? Or is it a pill? Or is it sounds and colors and all, you know, smells that we pipe in? But it's got to be really, really different. And so I think there's a, a, an interesting thing to get involved with when it comes in, comes to food for space for the future. Thank yeah. you. Welcome. <laughs> all right. Well, a shout out to the classrooms. A few have yeah. asked if there's going to be a Kahoot today. Uh, I decided that I would leave it out for more question time. I will send a link to the classrooms right after today's event if you do want to do a little Kahoot uh, and Those are so some fun. questions uh, <laughs> from Nicole joining us today. Nicole, oh, it's always such a great time to have you with us. Uh, I always learn something new about your travels, whether leaving the planet or below the surface. So it is always an absolute pleasure to have you with us. I love it, Joe. And let's do let's do this sometime together from space or from under the ocean. We need to get one of those Aquarius missions going. I think Absolutely. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Right. Well, Thanks students, me. let me bring them in front and center here so we can get a nice goodbye and thank you before we sign off. Here we go. Lots of. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. That was fun. Bye. <laughs>